Hey ladies, are you feeling overwhelmed by hormonal changes? Well, you're definitely not alone. There are more than 1,000 hormone disruptors living in our environment right now. It's sending your food, your water, the air you breathe, the clothes you wear, your skincare products. They all mess with your hormones. Then there's the natural hormone changes your body goes through. Premenopause, menopause. And while it's a natural process, it doesn't mean you have to suffer through it. The good news is you don't have to suffer through it anymore because now you have hormone harmony, a formula made only with herbal ingredients that are shown to reduce hormonal symptoms in women of all ages. Hormone harmony is not just a hormone support and supplement. It's become a phenomenon. Women can't stop talking about it on social media. A bottle of hormone harmony is sold every 24 seconds. And the biggest benefit? Well, my wife says it makes her feel like her own self again. And that's what women mention over and over in the reviews. And there are over 30,000 reviews for Hormone Harmony. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use code RLRC at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use code RLRC for 15% off today. That's H-A-P-P-Y-M-A-M-M-O-T-H dot com and use code R-L-R-C. Hey everyone and welcome to Real Life Real Crime Daily for Monday, April 3rd. And I am Jim Chapman. And I am Mike Agavino. And you went second again. You know what that means. Means the Woodster is missing. So... We are going to do our best to entertain you today. And we're going to start off. We've been talking a lot, Mike, uh, with everyone about the, of course, tragic BRPD helicopter uh, crash. And we've had several people reach out, ask if we had any information on like memorial services. Uh, and we do have that information for you. So a joint memorial service and funeral will be held Uh for the two fallen Baton Rouge officers, of course, Corporal Scotty Canzaro and Sergeant David Poirier, uh, who were killed in uh, when the Baton Rouge P, uh, Police Department helicopter they were flying in crashed in a cane field in West Baton Rouge. On April 6th, visitation will be held from 9 to 11 a.m. at a stream of Baptist Church. Uh, that's on Sam Rushing Road in Baton Rouge. And a joint memorial service will follow at 11 a.m. on April 6th, and it will be open to the public. So if you'd like to go and pay your respects, uh, following the visitation, a joint memorial service will follow April 6th at 11 a.m., open to the public. And outside of the church, a stream of Baptist church, there will be a 21 gun salute to honor the men and their sacrifices. That's great that they're doing that. Yeah. um, Well earned, deserved and, and uh, just pray for, pray for, uh, for the families and, and that they find, you know, you never find peace after things like these, but, but um, just saying many prayers for, for everybody involved and, and we'll miss these two heroes. So we'll move on and uh, tell you an interesting story. For those of you that like or don't like to go to the dentist. You, who, who likes to go to the dentist? Yeah, I know. It's, it, I don't know of anyone, to be quite honest. I'm not scared of the dentist. Some people have fears of that. I've never been a, a, a fearful of the dentist guy. I guess I've always had good ones that never hurt me. Thank you very much. Oh, I've, I've been through Doctor. some dentist torture. For sure. <laughs> have you? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, um, you know, I'm going to give you a story where a dentist has been accused of poisoning his wife's protein shakes. I think I might have gone to that guy. Yeah, yeah. After after um, after he met an orthodontist himself and wanted to start a new life. So James Tolliver Craig is accused of first degree murder in connection with the death of his wife, Angela Craig. He's 45 years old. And according to the affidavit, Craig is suspected of slipping potassium cyanide and arsenic into Angela's pre-workout shake. 
Hmm. So, Mike, okay. you better you better watch that. Uh, you might your wife might be telling you, oh, that's just protein, and it might be arsenic. Well, the good thing is Mike doesn't do the protein shakes around the house. It's yeah. the, it's the wife that does the protein <laughs> shakes, so she may have to uh, be on the lookout. That's right. So that day, she uh, the day that he he you know was suspected of doing this, uh, she had complained of feeling faint and dizzy, and so he took her to the hospital, and she was released that same day, but subsequently was in and out of the hospital until she was last admitted in which she died uh, recently. And an investigation into her death revealed that Craig had allegedly researched undetectable poisons and recently purchased potassium cyanide and arsenic. Wait, wait, wait. I'd say time, that's time pretty out. good time evidence. Out. Time out. Yeah. All of these smart, this guy's a dentist, right? Mm-hmm. Should be a he's, fairly intelligent. Yeah, he's definitely human got being, a brain. Think. This is like the idiot up in Boston that was, you know, searching all of the ways to get rid of a body and and everything else before he uh, the Anna Walsh case. Although I guess they haven't convicted him of anything yet. He hasn't been tried, but it's coming. Um, his day is definitely coming. <laughs> but um, uh, but so this guy goes and uh, and they find this Google search. They find the Google search, and not only that, you know, during that Google search, they noticed the undetectable poisons, and then he literally searched potassium cyanide and arsenic. Uh, and not only did he <laughs> recently search it, he purchased it. They had nice proof that he actually purchased it. So, yeah, that's pretty good evidence. The symptoms uh, Angela was experiencing – up until the day that she died, include loss of consciousness, seizures, and that's all consistent with that type of poisoning. So, uh, furthermore, police said that Craig had also been communicating with a fellow dentist in Austin, Texas, via email, and through these emails, they were able to tell this is a sexual relationship they're having. So now they have motive. You know, you're tying all these things together in any good case. And so they have proof of the purchase of these things. And now they have motive. And it and they went on to say it appears James was flying this woman into Denver while his wife and his mother and children, uh, of the mother of his children, were di- was dying in the hospital. So additional email evidence suggested he told his lover that Angela died, to which the woman responded, I do want to give you any comfort I can, but I do not feel it is right to mix in with all those others gathering to mourn Angela, and I do not want to meet your family as a friend and try to conceal what I feel for you. Sounds like the girlfriend didn't know about the poisoning plot there. Right, right. Yeah. Do we have pictures of the the uh, the wife who passed away? I'm and sure the, we, we and the uh, new pull those up. I just it's always uh, uh, good to try and see what uh, you know what the differential is that can <laughs> motivate a professional uh, living a very nice life with a really nice family to murder his wife. Right. So. Well, and and Craig, you know, if you're already thinking he's a he's not a very nice guy, you probably has a history of that. You'd be right. He had a history of cheating, and he also had an addiction to pornography. So uh, he also allegedly poisoned Angela in the past. Oh, really? Yeah. There's the wait, there's the wait, bomb for you. Wait, wait. Did was she aware that he had attempted to poison her in the past? Uh well. Uh, I don't know. I doubt it. I mean, I would I would imagine that uh, if she was aware of it, she would have got away from him the first time. But I'm sure she can, you know, after everything's said and done, she passes away. She probably had friends who said, you know, she was claiming to have these same symptoms a year ago uh, and all those sorts of things. So maybe that's where uh, the allegedly comes in. Uh, there were no char- charges filed in, in a, any time previous to that. But. Uh, I'm sure it's friends saying, oh, he's done this before. Mm. So it's unclear whether he's retained an attorney to comment on his behalf. 
but he is he is scheduled to appear in court. What a wonderful story! Special kind of his his penalty should start with the removal via pliers of each of his teeth individually. Ooh, I think yeah. would be a, an appropriate way to start off his letter family his do prison it. sentence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, God, nice. Well, we haven't done a cyber crime story in quite a while, and I thought, given everything that's happening regarding TikTok in Congress and this uh, six-month uh, uh, freeze of uh, of uh, technical development with uh, with AI that is being recommended, it would be a, a good time to do a cyber crime story and. We happen to have a hot off the presses cybercrime story where $87 million, $87 million was swindled off of elderly Americans. And uh, we're all, and I think most of the audience are in the demographic where we have, uh, hopefully, parents still alive, but in their 70s and 80s and maybe some of us 90s, where uh we get to see firsthand the challenges that new technology presents to uh, to the elderly, um, and, th- and those challenges are are huge. Uh, they're uh, they're running around with uh, iPhones. Uh, bought one for my mother. She's capable of texting and emailing and using her uh, solitaire app and a couple other card mm-hmm. game apps, but really doesn't do anything else on the phone. But is you know, very uh, uh, bewildered, uh, confused when she gets any kind of congratulations, you've won X or you only need to do Y in order to qualify for that. I mean, so much of that kind of spam is hitting people's phones who uh, don't know uh, the methods by which to block that stuff. I mean, are just kind of unaware and it's uh, it's kind of scary. And so uh, the elderly are very vulnerable Uh, to this kind of stuff. This particular scam um, involved a, uh, an operation that was based out of Thailand. And so the, uh, the AP reported that 21 suspects were arrested last Tuesday in raids that focused on nine different locations in Thailand. The authorities seized 162 bank accounts, multiple properties, 61 mobile phones, two cars, and a gun. I suppose if we have anything to be thankful for, it's that they only had one gun with this uh, this wonderful group. So this uh, wide ranging investigation was led by Thailand Cybercrime Investigation Bureau, uh, and they were uh, they were triggered to it uh, via information that came from the FBI and the U.S. Secret Service. So we alerted the Cybercrime uh, Investigative Unit in Thailand to. Uh, to this scam. So authorities allege that the scammers operated at a call centers and they claim to be law enforcement agents investigating money laundering. Interesting scam. They would tell victims that their bank accounts were suspicious and that money needed to be electronically transferred for the accounts to be verified. So presenting themselves as law enforcement, stating that they may have been victimized in a money laundering campaign and the only way for uh, the uh, these people, the alleged victims, to uh, protect themselves was for them to electronically transfer um, some money to be verified. So uh, victims' computers in some cases were hacked by the gang, uh, which sent viruses that allowed scammers to take control of the devices. The victims were mostly elderly, as I said, uh, some working as doctors, academics, Dentists, army personnel, uh, all kinds of uh, of different people, and so again, when it comes to folks, you know, over the age of fifty, over the age of sixty, it's not simply uh, a matter of targeting the uh, the uneducated. It's uh, people who are very successful, uh, still in the workforce, in in some cases, in large careers, but uh, but you know, we're not digital natives and never. Uh, adopted uh, certain uh, pieces of new technology. So Thailand's Deputy National Police Chief Pol Jan Torsak told a news conference 
at the Royal Thai Police Headquarters that 365 Americans were targeted. Most of them were age 60 and over. Investigators tracked the money as it was laundered through gold shops, restaurants, and various entertainment venues in the Thai province of Chambori, about 80 miles uh, away from Bangkok. Police said that Indian nationals were leading the syndicate and had assets hidden in Thailand, Cambodia, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, uh, the UAE, Peru, and Poland. So this was a pretty sophisticated operation here with them using a network of banks to launder and hide money. Five Indian nationals and 15 Thais have been charged with involvement in the transnational crime, uh, fraud by impersonating others, fraud of the people. Um, inputting false information into computer systems, money laundering, and conspiracy to launder money. That's according to the Bangkok Post. FBI cyber safety warnings state that government and personal in pers- – <sighs> boom, Jim. <laughs> FBI cyber safety warnings state that government – impersonation is a common fraud scheme that's frequently used to target the elderly. The FBI's website added that seniors are targeted by scammers because they tend to be trusting and are more likely to both own a home and have financial savings. Elder fraud is also a growing problem uh, and seniors rack up more than $3 billion in losses annually, according to the FBI. We have a senior that's a uh, part of the, uh, of the team here at Real Life Real Crime Daily. And I got a little piece of mail the other day that I thought was pretty interesting that I wanted to to share with you guys and share with Jim. So I get this nice check in the mail. Um, these people have cut me a check here for $14,920. It does say specimen on it, which again, a lot of elderly people might not understand what specimen means, but Here's the check they sent me. And the letter they sent me uh, starts with congratulations. Northern Millions Lottery would like to extend our warmest congratulations and best wishes to you. Your name was randomly chosen based on an active card purchase entry from one of our participating North American grocery stores or gas stations. A ticket number was assigned to each purchase from the pool of 2 million entries and yours was among five selected. As one of our five North Americans to be selected as an official prize winner, you have won cash for life, totaling $1,050,000 U.S. dollars. This will be distributed in $3,500 monthly installments after fees have been paid. After fees have been paid. This is my final notice. Apparently, these people had notified me several other times. I failed to get those. I have an assigned representative, this Gentle, fine gentleman named Paul Wilson. They give a number for Mr. Wilson, and they also give an address for where uh, Northern Millions is located. And I went and uh, and did a little search of uh, that address, and I found that that address was uh, to the Fortune Casino somewhere in the state of Washington. There's also a second address on the check, uh, which is interesting, but it's supposed to be their uh, their bank location. And when I searched that one, I found an abandoned warehouse in Brooklyn, New York. Hmm. And so, uh, but, you know, the average 70-year-old, 75-year-old, 80-year-old that gets this in the mail, uh, I don't know what their take rate on something like this is, but I'm sure once I would have called uh, Mr. Wilson, all that would have been necessary to confirm my million dollars plus of winnings would have been for me to uh, give them an account to wire the money to and other pieces of identification. And uh, uh, luckily we decided not to participate in this little thing. So unfortunately I won't be getting $14,920 or a million fifty over the rest of uh, my life, but um, be on the lookout, folks. Absolutely, and and I will tell you this, and one of our listeners to this show is Miss Lori Johnson, so shout out Lori. And Lori is the vice president of Hancock Whitney Bank. Lori is a big proponent and actually speaks on this at events 
on how the elderly can avoid becoming victims of fraud like this. It is a major issue. Um, you, you know, Lori has been in the banking industry for 25 years and she tells me it is very common uh, for people to get taken advantage of this. And of course, at some point you figure it out and you, you call your bank and you say, Hey, these charges aren't mine, that type of thing. Um, she has witnessed, uh, and as a matter of fact, sh- shout out to some banks who pay attention to people's accounts. And when they see things that don't look right, when you have personal bankers, uh, you know, they'll reach out and they'll say, you, you know, you're transferring money here, you're transferring money there, and, and, it, and it's at a high rate, and we're just trying to figure out what's going on. Because these elderly people are very easy to scare. And sometimes uh, these Taiwanese or whoever it is, we're not just picking on Taiwanese people here. I'm, there's some great Taiwanese people. But uh, no matter what country it is, um, they they will actually start screaming at these people if they don't do what they want them to do. So a very big problem. I don't know the number figure that annually of what those scams cost. But I would imagine it's in the upper, upper millions total, if not billions of dollars. Well, no, they said here that year. the FBI said it was $3 billion in losses annually. Yeah, just, there you go. Just elder fraud. Um, That's insane. Well, it's – again, if you have uh, elderly parents that are uh, holding you know, mobile technology, I'd suggest a couple of things that at least that I've noticed is – you know, there are a lot of uh, double verification procedures that go on, particularly with your bank, with credit cards you uh, you use that uh, that the elderly will avoid. So, yeah. you know, my mother would say, I don't want to bother with that. I, th- and no, mom, it's not hard. Yeah. All you need to do is remember one number and here's what we can here's what we can store it or um, uh, here's where we can put your password so that they're easily accessible to you. But uh, uh, but when you know when it involves money, make sure there's some kind of uh, authentication, uh, uh, double verification in uh, uh, in place and uh, and also make sure they don't have password warnings from their bank or again, from credit cards. Uh, I know every time I grab uh, my mother's phone and look at it, there's a number of warnings on passwords that have, uh, that have been released in leaks, uh, in hacks and uh, uh, the elderly do not want to have to go through password changes. And so many of them are using the same password for as long as whatever that website is will allow them to use that same password before forcing a change. And so, Hmm. uh, you know, yeah. Juggle those passwords occasionally and, and opt in to double verification. Absolutely. And now the next case we're going to bring you is just a a horrible case, but, uh, an astute neighbor, uh, kept this from becoming much worse. Uh, Michelle Campbell and Paul Weber, have been charged with endangering the welfare of a child and recklessly endangering a person. These parents, who were the parents of a six-year-old boy found locked in a cage in a Philadelphia home, have been arrested. The couple's neighbor called the police about 1 p.m. on Thursday after he had seen two girls, four and five years old, partially clothed and wandering outside in the rain in the backyard of the home where the pair lived. They have pampers on. They have no shirts. They have no pants. They have no shoes. They're screaming. It's raining. It's cold. And they're crying for their mother and father. Uh, Perez told police, the neighbor police arrived on the scene at the 4200 block of Glenview street and found the two girls crying in the rear of the house. They entered the property where they found another child, a six year old boy. And he was locked in a cage, a dog cage by a zip tie. The boy had been naked only with a blanket and pillow kept inside the cage. All three children were secured and transported to St. Christopher's Hospital for evaluation, and the children will be placed under the care of the state's Department of Human Services. An elderly woman and a 40-year-old man, whom police had 
identified as the kid's grandparents and uncle, were also found in the home, and two other children reside in the home, but had not been home at the time they were at school. Wait, wait, wait. so the, the grandparents That's correct. live there? The grandparents live there, elderly woman and a 40-year-old man, so, so it was a, a grandmother and an uncle also lived in that house. Yeah, that that's one of those stories that we, you know, just kind of shows you they make all types in this world, right? Oh, um, I won't say what I usually say about Philadelphia in this case. It has nothing to do with Philadelphia. Um, wow. Well, here's a here's a story of good fortune, Jim. Amazing good fortune. And good fortune for the elderly for a change. So um, Florida deputies were in pursuit of a robbery suspect and believed that that robbery suspect had entered a wooded area. And uh, so they they went in to pursue and there was aerial support uh, uh, assisting them. As they as they went in, so the the deputies were in the right place at the right time. They responded to this uh, uh, this robbery incident and uh, suspect that was uh, fleeing along the woods near Interstate two seventy five. This is Hillsborough County, Florida. Aerial footage from the sheriff's helicopter shows the chopper crew leading deputies through the trees toward an individual who appeared to be crawling on the ground. So the, uh, the surveillance from above picked up uh, an individual in that area and the, uh, the crew and the chopper were leading uh, the folks on the ground toward that, uh, that individual. Deputies believed they had located the suspect, but as they inched closer to the individual – they realized he was an elderly man and an elderly man had been reporting missing just a day earlier in this same area. That man suffers from Alzheimer's. And so what are the odds that, I mean, this guy was the uh, 75 year old man with Alzheimer's had no idea where he was. He was in the middle of the woods. He was crawling at the time that, they approached him and had it not been for this robbery and the subsequent chase to, uh, to apprehend the suspect and the use of, uh, of the helicopter to, uh, to assist in identifying somebody in that wooded area, they never find. Wow. This guy. What a blessing. And, and uh, just an unbelievable, you know, that you've heard the term needle in a haystack. That's, that's a needle. Spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from Uncommon Goods. The busy holiday season is here, and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list, all in one spot. Gifts to spark joy, wonder, delight, and that's exactly what I want it feeling. Hey, y'all, I ordered a super cool piece. It's a candle with a sculpture of an LSU Tiger Stadium on top of it. And each officially licensed laser cut wooden replica features up to four layers of detail, creating a bird's eye view of a specific football field, seating section, and more. And every label includes your stadium's name, the team's logo, and school location. And it has a coconut soy vegan wax infused with sandalwood smell that creates tailgates and touchdowns scent profile, reminiscent of game day. It's invigorating like fresh cut grass and nostalgic like smoke from a pre-game grill. And common like the crisp autumn air of a new semester on campus. Y'all, I love it. I have it at the base of my TV, and I'm ready to watch the Tigers play on Saturday night, right? Uncommon Goods. Look, when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. And many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S. They have the most meaningful 
out of the ordinary gifts anywhere. They even have gifts you can personalize. From holiday hosts and hostess gifts to the coolest finds for kids, to hits for everyone from the book lovers to diehard sports fans, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone, not the same old selection you can just find anywhere. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. So to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C. That's uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limit time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Gobble. All Gobble Meal Kits are pre-prepped. That means less work for you and less waste in your kitchen. Their meal kits include everything you need so you can save time at the store or just skip that trip entirely. I got the box in and I had three different meals. I had a Kung Pao chicken, crispy fish tacos, and a beef boom jignon. However you say it, but let me tell you about the classic beef boom jignon. Look, it came with beef pot roast and a beef broth concentrate, red wine demi glaze, cremini mushrooms, ciapelloni onions, mashed potatoes, baby carrots, and rosemary thyme butter. It was so easy to make. Literally like 15 minutes it took Cindy. And let me tell you something, and all the dishes were fire, but this thing was like a taste explosion in my mouth. It's just un real we've got to spend more time together and more time doing the things we love because everything came in this one single box right to my door so see what a difference gobble will make for your household right now they're offering my listeners a fantastic limited time deal you get a hundred and twenty dollars off across four boxes plus free shipping and free cookies. And let me tell you, those cookies, I ate one that was sin baked and it was delicious. Go to gobble.com slash real life. That's G-O-B-B-L-E dot com forward slash real life for $120 off your first four boxes. This offer is not available on the home site, so don't miss out. This is genius. It's taste explosions in your mouth like you never had. In a in a haystack of needles. I mean, that's that's almost an, an impossible thing that happened, and I know that family is just absolutely relieved to get yeah, somebody was back. looking out for Grandpa. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. What a what a story that is. Um, Mike, we ain't got our sound effects yet, but I got a few on this thing, and I can't remember what is what, but we'll just spontaneously push one okay <laughs> so that's people laughing we can't use that one there you go that's people clapping that's what they do when they hear there you go so so there you go that's our that you're all excited you heard the clapping for today in true crime history and is there a is there a booing button i don't think there's a, there's booing a button, button to boo okay Oh, That'd be great for a mysteri- question. <laughs> mysterious button. <laughs> yeah, that should be the t- today in true crime. So what happened today in true crime history? And I have a great one for you today, Mike. These are all people you've heard of. No cheating. So okay. in, in 1882, we're going to bring you all the way back to 1882. One of America's most famous criminals, Jesse James, was shot to death by a fellow gang member, Bob Ford, who betrayed James for reward money. This happening on April 3rd, 1882. I didn't know that that's how Jesse James went down. Yes, indeed. He was betrayed by by his fellow gang members. So, 1936, Bruno Richard Hopman. (laughs) What, man? (laughs) Hopman. (laughs) We're going with Hopman. Hopman. Hopman, okay. Convicted of the 1932 kidnapping and murder of the 20-month-old son of Charles Lindbergh was executed. The Lindbergh kidnapping. Via at electrocution. So that was in 1936. And y'all got to remember, 1936, they weren't, you know, that was kind of the inception of, of electric chairs. So I'm sure, I'm sure that was some volts going through him because they couldn't really control it back in those days. 
Uh, but yep. Is Charles, that before? Very or famous. And that must have been after his famous flight. Right? That was after his famous flight. Yes. Uh, 1996, federal agents in Montana apprehended Ted Kaczynski, an American terrorist known as the Unabomber, who had killed three persons and injured more than 20 with explosives sent through the U.S. postal system. And I remember that going on when I was younger, and I was like freaked out, and then Unsolved Mysteries put out this big thing on it, and yeah, it scared me to death. I wouldn't check the mail for like two years. Uh, not that it... it- uh, it makes him any less of uh, a horror, but I didn't, I thought it was a larger number than three. I don't know why he injured 20. Tw- yeah, uh, it was 23 victims, but only three were killed um, from the Unabomber. But what a strange case that was. You know, if we ever, if we ever do, I know y'all are missing the crimes of the century. If we ever do another one, we need to do it on the Unabomber. Cause that was a, that was a, uh, really interesting case. Woody, Woody unilaterally canceled the crime. <laughs> he did. You, you will not be getting any more crimes. <laughs> Executive privilege. Yes. Okay. Well, I need a sound effect. And since I know what some of them are, Jim, um, I'm going to go for the mysterious button. Let's, let's hit the mysterious button here. That was that one. Uh, no, I think it's one below. There you go. Ah, uh, Let's give it to him one more time. We'll turn it up. That's perfect. And what could be more mysterious than a, they stole what? They stole what? I'm not going to believe what the what is here. Um, Tanks filled with thousands of dollars worth of bull semen were stolen from a truck Sunday night in California. They stole what? <laughs> they stole <laughs> nearly 3,500 units of bull semen. That's enough to potentially impregnate a thousand cattle. Wow. So wait, that would presume that the bull fires uh, and misses one out of every three and a half shots, wouldn't it? It would. Yeah. So I, you know, sort of takes away from the bull res- respect factor I had for bulls there. But uh, but uh, this is some valuable, sticky stuff, people. Tim Reese had spent months collecting the semen, reportedly worth nearly $50,000 from his bulls, including one considered the fifth most prized bull in the world. Now, my question would be, how do you collect the semen? <laughs> Uh, there's little bull magazines that you uh, you <laughs> give them, you send them to a stall room, and they sit down and they hand you a test tube and they're done. Um, <laughs> by the way, when when I was at Vandy, uh-huh. they were uh, they were in the middle at Vandy Hospital of doing a bunch of research uh, that ultimately led to the male, uh, uh, what do you call it, pregnancy pill, the male. Um, oh, uh, Viagra. No, not Viagra. This is a, oh, a male um, contracept the the contraceptive pill. I don't, what, so the male birth control pill. I, um, there's a male. I, is there? Yeah, I don't know the male, name of it. Yeah, there's. Most, I, I wouldn't even most men with don't, that. which uh, is a a bone of contention for literally a bone of contention for <laughs> uh, for women. But uh, yeah, that and, and because that research was going on, they were paying. 75 bucks a shot back in the 1980s. Um, now, I don't know, what, what would we figure? $50,000 for a thousand shots is, well, it's 3,500 units, but for impregnating a thousand cattle, that's that's 50 bucks for each. Actually, this sounds undervalued to me. I think this, the bull, his prize bull could have negotiated a better. Hmm. A better deal if the the bull had better representation. I, what makes somebody who, who does the ranking of prized bulls? That'll be that's something we need to we need to look at. I don't know what you have to do with the bull to decide where the bull ranks. I don't know. If Woody was here, he yeah, could I was tell about us. To say Woody would. Woody knows Woody all about this stuff. Uh, I'm gonna make Woody <laughs> chime in on this in a post. Um, 
The guy went on to say, you're trying to make a living. The loss of all those units of semen and probably taken by someone who had no idea what they were stealing is very frustrating. Collected two or three times a week, the highly prized semen is shipped to farms in California and across the world to impregnate cattle. The animals are considered the cream of the crop and are selected for their genetic value. The genetics that these bulls have in them is out of the top 1% of the world population. So we are talking about elite bulls here. Over 70 to 75% of all cattle in the U.S., is inseminated artificially. So hmm. there's not that much sex going on out there in cattle land. No. Nope. Um, probably why these guys are so easy to tip over at night. Um, the tanks that hold the genetic material are reportedly filled with liquid nitrogen to be stored at about 320 degrees, minus 325 degrees, I'm sorry, Fahrenheit, to keep the sperm frozen. The tanks must be handled by professionals. Otherwise, it could be dangerous. So they... They think who knew they didn't know what they were stealing. And Tim, poor Tim Reese is out fifty thousand dollars and has to explain to his prize bull why he's not getting compensated this month. Fifty thousand dollars in bull semen. And and you know, honestly, one percent of the population of bulls, I'd imagine that means something maybe maybe Woody can explain a little about that. I know he's listening. The head of the bull class. What happens to bulls that are in the second to 99th, uh, 100th percentile? I mean, they just. They become stakes, I guess. I stakes or uh, <laughs> maybe they're in the uh, the bullfighting business. I don't know. Yeah. Something like that. Give me uh, some out music. Uh, yeah, you we, got we, it. Here we go. That was They Stole What? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right, more than 30 animals seized from a Tennessee breeding mill. Y'all, Tennessee law enforcement has seized 34 animals from a breeding mill where the animals were living in inhumane conditions. Animal Rescue Corps said it assisted law enforcement in rescuing around 25 dogs, seven cats, and two chinchillas from the backyard breeding operation in Macon County. The dogs were found in cages, They were in filthy conditions. Many of the large dogs were living in small cages. They were some of them unable to even turn around in the cage. Uh, Many of the dogs were discovered with medical conditions, including puncture wounds, mammary tumors, overgrown nails, pressure wounds, skin inflammation, all kinds of things, parasites. The animals were subjected to unsanitary housing, neglect, and inadequate veterinary care, obviously. Many were too afraid to leave their cages, according to Animal Rescue Corps. The animals had been used and bred for profit with no regard for their needs. Animal Rescue Corps was quoted as saying on Facebook, so they transported the animals to its rescue center in Gatlin, where they would be provided with urgent medical, physical, and emotional care. The organization will document the cruelties for evidence packages and ensure they find loving homes. The animal owners were arrested and charged with animal cruelty. Now, uh, I got curious after that because uh, it sounded like a pretty good organization that I was unfamiliar with, had not heard of, called Animal uh, Rescue Corps. And I, I kind of looked up, checked out their website, and they what they do, y'all, they're a nonprofit that protects domesticated animals throughout North America through a large scale emergency rescue and disaster response. Uh, they provide shelter relief and education and training. So when you have a disaster like I'll give you an example. In 2016, there was a horrible flood in Denham Springs, Louisiana, flooded an entire city, th- over thirty five hundred houses. And uh, there was a lot of pets that were left behind in a, in, in a company like or a nonprofit like Animal uh, Rescue Corps would come in and they would assist not only in getting these pets out of there, but also uh, sheltering those pets somewhere. Because that's, a, that's an issue we, any disasters, and in South Louisiana where we're based out of, we get hurricanes, we get, we get a lot of disasters being on the coast. And a lot of people forget about the pets and what happens to them because a lot of times you can't take them. Shelters a lot of times will not allow you to bring your pets um, for, for, you know, it's just so many people in there. But 
Uh, so there's, if you want to check them out and support them, animal rescue corps. God, I can't imagine make, I, I wouldn't leave. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't leave without, we, we wouldn't, no, there's no way. I, I, I was in that situation and I brought, I had my doll, my beautiful Dotson who is 15 now happy, happy. Hey, if happy. you're listening, thank you for listening. <laughs> but, um, happy, uh, came with us during that flood, of course. And, uh, and we were on the side of, you know, a major highway and we had our, our Dotson right there in our arms and she never left our side for that entire time. So yeah, your pets are like family and, uh, shout out to animal rescue corps for, for doing what they can to, uh, support that. Yeah. I imagine a lot of people put themselves at serious risk because they refuse to leave their pets behind and, and, uh, uh, and make you know whatever the uh, the escape the rescue is that they have to go through more difficult because they are protecting the pet. But no doubt, folks, we talked the other day about uh, you know polarization in the in the country and some of these issues that have become so toxic that um, that you can no longer talk amongst friends or even family about uh, about some of them and and. Uh, you know, here's a here's a crime that's indicative of just how toxic uh, certain beliefs are to one side or uh, the other of a particular debate. And so I'm going to tell you the story of a pro-life center that was bombed in the state of Wisconsin. And this name isn't easy, but I'm going to give it a shot here. Harindu Sankar Roy Chowdhury is charged in an attack on Wisconsin Family Action, which is a pro-life center, and was arrested in Boston while trying to flee the United States. So how they got this guy is some amazing police work. DNA found in a half-eaten burrito helped expose the former Wisconsin University research assistant, now accused of firebombing a pro-life center, last Mother's Day. So the original crime was uh, May of of 22. The attack on the headquarters of Wisconsin Family Action in Madison came about a week after the leak of the Supreme Court draft opinion that would later overturn Roe v. Wade. I'm sure everybody remembers last year that that a leak uh, came out long before the Supreme Court was ready to uh, Make an official uh, official ruling, and uh, there were uh, there were threats of attacks at uh, several justices' uh, homes, and uh, all kinds of uh, uh, of craziness following that leak. And the investigation never turned up anyone uh, to be held responsible for it. They did not figure out who did it. Mm. So, about ten months after a Molotov cocktail was tossed inside the office. And the message, quote, if abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either, was scrawled on the building's side. This guy, Harindu Sankar, 29 of Madison, was arrested in Boston on Tuesday and charged with one count of attempting to cause damage by means of fire or an explosion. The Justice Department said he traveled from Madison to Portland, Maine, and he purchased a one-way ticket from Boston to Guatemala City, Guatemala, departing that week. Law enforcement arrested him at Logan International Airport in Boston. According to the complaint, uh, Harindu Sankar used an incendiary device in violation of federal law in connection with his efforts to terrorize and intimidate a private organization. Assistant Attorney General Matthew Olson of the Justice Department's National Security Division said in a statement, I commend the commitment and professionalism of law enforcement personnel who worked exhaustively to ensure that justice was served. Violence is never an acceptable way for anyone to express their views or opinions of disagreement. Today's arrest demonstrates the FBI's commitment to vigorously pursue those responsible for this dangerous attack and others across the country and hold them accountable for their criminal actions. According to the complaint on Mother's Day, Sunday, May 8th, 2022, law enforcement responded to an active fire at an office building located in Madison. Once inside the building, police observed a mason jar under a broken window. The jar was broken and the lid and screw top were burned black. 
The police also saw a purple disposable lighter near the mason jar on the opposite wall from the window. The police saw another mason jar with the lid on and a blue cloth tucked into the top, and the cloth was singed. The jar was about half full of a clear fluid that smelled like an accelerant, according to the complaint. Outside the building, someone spray-painted on the wall, again, quote, if abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either. In March 2023, law enforcement identified this guy as the suspect, and the affidavit said officers conducting surveillance on a protest at the Wisconsin State Capitol over the construction of an Atlanta public safety center observed an individual later identified as this guy. Local police officers observed him dispose of food in a public trash can, and the officers recovered the leftover food and related items, and law enforcement uh, matched the DNA. And so while this was uh, the crime was committed back last May, and they knew who this guy was, they did uh, not have uh, uh, a way to link him to uh, the crime and, and prove his uh, that he was there and uh, the DNA that they were able to produce from the half-eaten sandwich here is uh, half-eaten burrito is uh, what allowed them to match. So on March 17, 2023, law enforcement advised that a forensic biologist examined the DNA evidence recovered from the attack scene and compared it to the DNA collected from the burrito. The forensic biologist found that the two samples matched and likely were the same individual, according to the Justice Department. And so this guy is now facing 20 years in prison, according to prosecutors. And again, we got to get back to a place where we peacefully protest the things we don't believe in. And yes, this is a contentious uh, issue in the United States, a very contentious one, uh, but one where Uh, Both sides should express their opinions and peacefully protest um, firebombing abortion clinics or a pro-life center uh, really does not Uh, accomplish anything. Nothing and nothing. And, and, um, you know, just about DNA in general, which played a big role in this case, uh, my opinion, probably the biggest advancement in science of the entire century and the because dna does two unique things not only can it uh you know vilify you if you've been convicted of a crime or exonerate you rather if you've been convicted of a crime but it can also convict you of a crime where no other evidence may exist if you really sit back and you think about the science of DNA, it it's a, probably the most valuable tool crime has now on both ends of the spectrum. There have been numerous people released from prison sure. due to DNA evidence. And on the other side of that, there have been people not only convicted on DNA evidence, but identification of bodies you know you find bones you have no idea who they are dna made that possible what an bunch of what an amazing piece of science sure you know when you really wrap your head around that so this this situation you you nailed it right on the head there's as a society we've got to get back to um being able to express our opinions um without taking things to that level and um, so just a, a crazy situation there. Now, an inmate in Florida is facing new charges for allegedly planning the murder of her family after she was put in prison for threatening to kill her co-workers. Uh, Sheriff Marco Lopez said Turi Inaru, 29, allegedly told two fellow inmates at the County Department of Corrections in Kissimmee, Florida, that her family was very wealthy and that she would pay them $50,000 per death of her family members. Uh, Once she got to jail, she befriended her cellmate, started talking about wanting her parents and her grandparents killed, that she would pay them up to 50 grand, saying they were very wealthy, and she gave the address. Instead of acting on the promised son, Inaru's fellow inmates turned her over to correctional officers. Now, 
Inaru, who was initially locked up for aggravated stalking and threatening to kill her former co-workers, allegedly told the inmates that her inheritance was worth about $2 million. But she would only get access to the money following the death of her mother, father, and grandparents. The murder for hire offer also included the murder of assistant state attorney with the 9th District, who was prosecuting her initial charges. And detectives were able to obtain evidence to link uh, Inaru, who threatened her family members, along with other threats uh, of violence that she had made. Okay, wait. So, so it was fifty thousand apiece, and there were parents and grandparents that had to be killed. Mm-hmm. So that's two hundred grand. Right. Mm. Then we've got uh, the state attorney, uh, uh, state attorney. They're also worth 50 K. Apparently. Yep. Okay. So now we're at 250 K. Um, the inheritance in total is 2 million, 2 million. And probably assume that, uh, that the family has set up the right, uh, the right kind of trust to protect <laughs> themselves on the tax side of that thing. Okay. So, I mean, I guess that, that calculation zeroes out, right? Yeah. Would you pay a quarter? She's probably going to get, you know, let's say she's going to get 1.8 out of that or so. So to give away 250 is to give away 15% or so of that money. Would you, yeah, that seems like a fair bounty price, Jim, if I'm just costing out her, her, uh, her plan there. So, well, and, you know, she was originally put in the jail where she's offering all this money because she was using social media, Facebook, to stalk the assistant state attorney prosecuting other cases that she had. So uh, Facebook stalking is a real thing, man. And the, and this guy's a state attorney, and, and she's harassing him online to the point that he said, I'll put you in jail for stalking. You won't leave me alone. You're threatening to kill me. That's just what he did. And look, she wanted to kill everybody at that point. So just another example of craziness. Now, but if you got that money, I mean, what can you do with it in prison? What do you mean? Well, so well, those people, I'm, I'm assuming the people were going to get out at some point. So she was probably like, I'll give you $50,000. No, but and- I mean, for for an Aru. I mean she's in prison, right? Not for the rest of her life. She ain't killed nobody. Well, how many She years, was in prison for she stalking. Have? She's probably only gonna be in there thirty days. I mean, you don't get no you don't get no time for for Facebook stalking somebody. She might have only been in there over the no, weekend. Oh come on. How how long was she it didn't say how long she was supposed to be in there? No. It, but it but right, it I said what she thing. was in there for, which was stalking. Uh I mean, you're not going to get a life sentence for stalking. Well, but as a prosecutor, she was stalking. Yeah, but I mean, you're going to get my you kill somebody and you get seven years nowadays. I mean, for stalking, you go, you know, it's basically making a threat on Facebook. You're not mm-hmm. going to get no time for that. Uh, she was probably just in there waiting for bond or something. But anywho. Awfully trusting to make that kind of a proposal to folks that you're barely acquainted with. I doubt are, she has who are million understood dollars. as known criminals. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if she if they believe she really had that money, they probably wouldn't have reported her. <laughs> um, whether you know, regardless of anything else, so I doubt she has two million dollars. She's she's running that might have belonged in the stupid crime segment. Maybe so. Maybe so. Until next time, I'm Jim Chapman. I'm Mike Agavino. And for Woody Overton, your host of Real Life, Real Crime Daily, peace. Show business. Shop early, save big, all month long during Black Friday buildup at Lowe's. Right now, get select pre-lit artificial Christmas trees starting at just $59.98. Don't wait to save. Shop these deals today, in-store or online. Because Lowe's knows deals. Discount taken at time of purchase. While supplies last. Selection varies by location.